Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cold Hard Truth Podcast. I'm Jack Smith. I'm Shrikar Rajendran. I'm Anish Gupta. And I'm Christian Klosterman. Yes, yeah, so we got our, we got a guest on Raiders fan today to trying to go over the AFC West off seasons right now. Let's start with the Broncos. What would you guys think of their off season? Uh, well, you know, smart teams build in the trenches, and I think it was important for the Denver Broncos to do so as they move forward with Drew Locke as their quarterback, and they did that by signing Graham Glasgow. In my opinion, one of the best interior offensive linemen available on that free agent market, and they also traded a seventh rounder for Jarrell Casey. Uh, the team did lose Chris Harris, but it traded for A.J. Bouye before Harris officially walked. And then they also franchise tag Justin Simmons, who was a key part of that defense. And that's going to give themselves extra time to work out that long-term deal with him. Um, I also think um, cutting Joe Flacco was important for cap flexibility, if that makes sense. Uh, I think it saved him around like $10 million. And... I think when we look at the Broncos, we're also going to look at that Melvin Gordon signing. And I don't think he necessarily addresses a need, not with Lindsey and Freeman on the roster, but I think he came at a, he came at a good price. Like they're going to pay him some decent money. I think the Broncos, they, they have a really bright future. I honestly see them as a playoff team next year. Like I, th- I think they can, I mean, in, especially in this new format, I mean, I think they're finally investing into Drew Locke, which I thought they should have done way before in the season. He went 4-1 and one to finish the, finish the season, right, in his final five games. And like you said, Shrigar, the Graham Glasgow signing was really good. I agree with that. Obviously, trading for A.J. Boye, I think it's, it's – it's, I have mixed feelings about that considering I haven't seen him play well as a number one corner. In Houston, he didn't, he didn't really have that number one role with Jonathan Joseph there and then also with the Jags, with Jalen Ramsey. He played a lot better with Ramsey versus on his own. So I think this signing is good. It could be up and down. It really depends on what they do in that system. Um, Melvin Gordon, the signing, I think it just hurts Lindsay's development because, I mean, they're going to have to let go. Like, I think Devontae Booker's gone, but they're going to have to choose between Royce Freeman, um, Melvin Gordon, and obviously Philip Lindsay, who are all three great young running backs who each have a mix of both. They can both catch. They can all run. Obviously, Royce Freeman is more of an in-between-the-tackles kind of guy. But I think in regards to what the Broncos did, I really like how they, they set themselves up. Obviously, the loss of Connor McGovern was kind of big. And I think they do need to build up the interior of their line a bit more than just uh, Blasco. But other than that, I think Drew Locke has a bright future ahead of him, especially with those young guys with Cortland Sutton and uh, those young guys on defense. Keep in mind, Bradley Chubb is coming back. And pair him with Jarrell Casey. I mean, that D-line could be potentially scary. Obviously, the loss of Derek Wolf, but I think Jarrell Casey feels in nice. So I, I like where this team is headed. Christian, what do you think? I think it was solid all around for them. I I really don't see any bad moves. I still think in terms of offense, they still have a lot to prove, right? The wide receiver core is still looking a little lackluster. They need to draft a good wide receiver. This is a stacked wide receiver class this year. And I think if they draft a good receiver, I think they're in a great place. We already know the defense is elite. All the moves that they made made sense to me. Still a little thin on the offensive line, but I think you would you think would do you think they should go offensive line in the first round? Or should they go receiver? I go receiver. I think receivers. I go receiver. I, think receivers, I go receiver. Especially them, at 15, that's when all the receivers are going to go. Exactly. And you need to take a receiver there. So, see, I would, I, I, I would lean there. But, like, like, I, like I said this all the time, offensive line is, for me, I, it's so important. And I think you've got to protect Drew Locke. You have to. Like he, he's but here's shown the thing. signs of being a franchise quarterback. Are you talking about tackle or guard? Because um, all the I tackles mean, I are going to be can, gone, dude. That, that's not they, really there's, true. No, that's not there's true. A, yeah, there's exactly. a chance now that that Becton maybe if he doesn't go at four, I think he but might fall. And then I also Giants are le- Giants are leading Simmons. Possible. I think I think they could slip. So he's keep not it, if there's a tackle, 15. if there's a tackle available, I would suggest going there. And I mean, it all depends on what Tampa Bay does with the 14 pick. But if if he does, if a tackle slips, if I was da- if I was John Elway, I would want to protect my quarterback as much as possible because he's severely struggled to find a replacement for Peyton Manning. And we yeah. all can agree there. He's gone through Simeon, Paxton, Lynch. I mean, all these guys that, like, haven't done anything. And, I mean, Drew Locke is looking good so like, and looking to be their guy. So, I think they should first look to protect him. And I think Cortland Sutton could easily be a number one receiver with the right development. And but the problem is they, they don't have snag, a number two. That is true. Exactly. So if, yeah, That's why I was thinking one fit, one fit for them could be CeeDee Lamb because I think he's going yep, to be yeah. there at 15. But – if you want to go in the tackle direction, if the Bucks don't take Andrew Thomas, I think that's where the Broncos slide oh, in yeah, and grab their sure. tackle. Yeah. Yep. 
I yeah. wouldn't take anyone on the tackle board below Thomas if I were them at pick 15. But oh, yeah. I think you guys spoke exactly. to it. I, I, I liked their offseason. I didn't think it was one of the best in this division because this is one of the best divisions, I think, this entire oh, offseason. Yeah. Yep. But the Jarrell Casey trade, I thought, was one of the most underrated moves of the offseason because Jarrell Casey is one of the most underrated players in the league. He's yep. a perennial pro bowler, and they stole him for a seventh-round pick. And then, yep. I mean, they lost. McGovern and Chris Harris and Derek Wolf, who were all pretty good, but they rebuilt in other positions that I thought they needed. So overall, and they got I, younger too. Yeah, overall. I give them probably a B or B plus. Yeah, that was exactly I mean, what I was gonna go. I mean, prior to the start of free agency, the I think the Broncos sat in the top ten when it came to like projected cap space. So they could have been bigger players, but the moves they did make were good. You know, retaining Simmons while bolstering the offensive and defensive lines. And maintaining that cap space is a good way to head into the draft. And with Drew Locke only entering his second season, they're better off playing the long game right now than spending all of their cash. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to give him a B, maybe a B minus, just because I don't know where I feel about the Melvin Gordon signing. Uh, but I think that's a solid grade, especially for this team that's still building. Yeah. Christian, I would agree. I'd give, I'd give him a B as well. Uh, I think they, I still need to see them draft a really good either tackle or wide receiver for them to have a great offseason. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm leaning B, B plus just because they, it all depends on what they do in the draft. If they can fill one of those two needs, tackle or receiver, preferably tackle, I'm, I would give them a B plus, A minus on their offseason. But I think right now I'm leaning towards more of a B just because there's still some questions I have with their offense and just their consistency on defense if they can all gel all those guys together. But I think solid offseason from them. Yeah. And now let's move on to the Chiefs. Not a whole lot to talk about, but what do you guys think of the couple moves they made? I mean, you said it best. Like, it's good to be the champs. And I don't think the Chiefs, you said it, they haven't been much of a factor in free agency, yet they will still be among the biggest favorites to hold up the Lombardi Trophy next season. And I think the biggest move for them, we can all agree on this, was franchise tagging Chris Jones. I mean, he is the most disruptive force not named Aaron Donald at his position, in my opinion. And now the Chiefs can either re-sign him to a long-term deal, you can let him play on the one-year tag, or you could just trade him for a massive haul of draft picks because there are going to be teams that are going to want him. And with that, you know, that Patrick Mahomes contract extension coming up, that's going to set a record for sure. They may be forced to go with the latter plan because I don't know if they're going to be able to pay both Chris Jones and Mahomes. But for now, bringing him back, I think that keeps the pass rush looking title worthy. Um, they did lose Emmanuel Ogba. That's going to hurt. But he was a complimentary player, if we're being honest. And I thought bringing back Damian Williams was wise. If yeah. you look at his produ production down the stretch as the Chiefs' primary back, that looked smart. Um, they also signed Mike Remmers. And Mike Remmers wasn't really – great starting tackle for the Giants but I don't think he's going to be expected to fill that role in Kansas City he's a perfectly fine swing tackle and he's going to help with line depth after they lost Stephen Wisniewski I think when we look at the Chiefs I think their priority here is just to keep they've got to keep contracts low for Mahomes because he's going to change their entire landscape so they're just kind yep. of keeping it safe and I I like their moves I think Remmers isn't even going to like have that big of a role like you said I think because they have Fisher and Schwartz they're kind of solidified there um, but I think with Chris Jones, first of all, don't sleep on Fletcher Cox. I mean, I, I think Fletcher Cox should be in that discussion. But um, when you look at Chris Jones, I think signing him was good to keep that defensive line intact because they, they turned it on at the end of the year. I think the defense had questions all of last year. And I think this year they kind of stepped it up in the playoffs, when it, especially when it mattered more, most in the fourth quarter so, of the Super Bowl. So I think they, they made the right move by keeping him, even if it was by the franchise tag, they didn't make many moves. I mean, what they re-signed uh, Demarcus Robinson. I mean, that was great. Like he was a slot receiver. It was a pretty good move. Um, they, I mean, when I look at it, I think they already have their core intact, and they're just trying to keep it as stable as possible. Because, I mean, there's always that notion of the Super Bowl hangover, and I think they're just trying to keep the same culture that they have going into next year. Yeah, that's exactly great. how I view it too. I think they also added some depth with Antonio Hamilton, right? Very weak yep. position for them already at mm -hmm. corner. And same thing with Remmers, right? They needed more offensive line help. So I added him as depth. I think they were great moves, not really amazing moves. Nothing that's going to make you jump out of your seat, but, but I think the loss help of Kendall retain their Fuller Super Bowl status. Pretty big. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was going to get to. I think yeah. losing Kendall Fuller, I, I mean, that's brutal because they already really didn't have any corners and going into next year, their cornerback room is quite arguably maybe the worst in the league yeah. for a range, that chance, which is pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. But I mean, with the 31st pick or 32nd pick, 
they can take a corner. There's going to be oh, a yeah. lot of corners there. Or they could trade back because they only have five draft picks. So. Yeah, that yeah. is true. But, I mean, I think re- re-signing Demarcus Robinson was smart because he kind of showed to be the second option from a home at times. Well, third, I guess, behind Kelsey. But he was he was good last year. And then tagging Chris Jones, I mean, you, you couldn't not bring Chris Jones back after what he's done for them. Oh, yeah. But I think mm-hmm. trading him might be the smarter option at the moment just because you said the impending contracts they're going to have to shell out. Well, I think they did that with D Ford last year. I think they kind of knew that they were going to have to pay Mahomes. So I think D Ford was a big, big guy that they traded away. I think Chris Jones, they will be able to, it all depends on Frank Clark, I think, because they do mm-hmm. kind of have him locked up. So both, having those massive contracts on the D line will be kind of, it'll kind of affect them going forward. But I mean, they were showing good strides and they do want to keep that because the Chiefs really don't, they've never had a defensive identity throughout their tenure in the NFL anyway. Yeah. And I think it's it's been on it's been on an upwards direction, especially with the addition of the Honey Badger last year. I think he yeah. made a huge difference for them. And I was such a big fan of the signing. Like he's he's a great leader on the team. He's such a hybrid safety. And I think the team still has their fundamentals and their what they what basic their main core of what they won last year with. All they gotta do is just, you know, keep going. Like the division is definitely gonna be tougher. So I can like if we look to in terms of their outlook into next year, I can honestly see them losing like two more games compared to last like they could go in as a 10 and 16 but like they have the playoff experience so I mean even going 10 and 6 they can still make some big runs in the playoffs so I'm, I'm not worried yeah. about this team but in go- regards well, to grades great, I'll then. just yeah so um, I'll just start mine off okay uh real quick to finish my segment I I would I would give them a c plus b minus just because they didn't do much but I feel like they maintained their core which was mainly important so that was my grade for them uh I'm gonna go ahead and give them a b you know there isn't a ton to grade here as the Chiefs they already have a Super Bowl winning roster. I think Jones was the main issue to address this offseason, and they bought extra time to make a long-term decision by tagging him. So I'm just going to go ahead and give him a B. Um, they did good for what they had. I gave him a C plus, super average offseason. Yep. That, that's about it. Still a great core. Yeah. I'd say, like, benchmark, I'd probably give – like, if I'm going to give a team that stayed the exact same – really didn't get better or worse. I'd give him a B. And I think the Chiefs got a little bit worse this offseason, so I'll give him a B minus. Because I think losing Kendall Fuller, well, yeah. there was nothing they could really do about it. It did make them worse as a team. So I, just, I can't give him anything above a B. So I'll give him a B minus. Let's move on to Christian's Raiders. Christian, you want to start us off? Yeah, a very weird offseason, but it also a great one. Corey Littleton, great signing. Then the oh, other yeah. Chicago, uh, former Chicago Bears linebacker, I'm not going to butcher his name. I'm not going to do that. But that was Kukowski, a great signing. I think is how you say it. Yeah. I, I'm not Quick even going to Quick Kowski. Quick Kowski. Yeah, there you go. There you go. But I think those two signings plus Jeff Heath, I feel like they provided depth and positions they really lacked in. Last year, their defense was horrible, right? One of the worst mm-hmm. in the league. They needed help at linebacker. They got it and they got it. And it was a great deal in terms of the Littleton deal and the whatever the other guy's name is deal. That was great. Both great yeah. deals. And they had tons of cap already. But right now what they're showing is that they're going all in. Mm-hmm. Even with the signing of Mariota, they're going all in at this point. Mm-hmm. I, yep. I don't know if that's the right move for them right now. I can't you say didn't like the, You didn't like the signing of Mariota? I don't know how I feel about it yet. I still have to see one more season or even half a quarter of a season, Derek Carr, to see if he's – because I didn't trust him last year. He's too conservative. I, I didn't mm-hmm. like him last year. I think it's good that they're introducing a little bit of competition for him because while he's been there, everyone says they should move on from Carr, but there's been no one they can move on to unless you want Nathan Peterman taking snaps. So I think introducing no, I Mariota gives some competition going into the offseason. I, I think it's a good Mariota, Mariota has won a playoff game. So he's had, yeah. he's had flashes of being good. And I still remember in 2016, he actually had his – towards the second half of the season, he like surged and uh, both with his legs and with his arm. So he's shown flashes. Obviously, he hasn't been able to – his consistency is his main issue. And with the Raiders, I just don't know what they're doing at quarterback, like having these guys in because they're – both of them are expensive. And, I mean, I don't trust them to be franchise. Derek Carr was just his fibula injury kind of like – it derailed him a little bit. Like he was, he was really an MVP candidate that year. And um, – Obviously, the whole injury kind of derailed his, honestly, his career. But I think he still has a chance to pick it back up. He did decent this year. Um, people are kind of overlooking what he had. He had a decent police completion percentage. Um, with their, they made a lot of like mini signings, not anything big. I mean, obviously Nelson Aguilar, I, I don't trust him, but like I don't know to add some type of depth, I guess. Carl Nassib is a decent signing. Uh, obviously, you guys mentioned Jeff Heath, um, Malik Collins. Like they, they made a bunch of low key signings that I think just add to their depth and core of what they're trying to build because the Raiders, like, 
I don't, I don't see them having, they don't have like a whole like a bunch of star talent, but they have yeah. these collection of guys that know their role. And I think especially for a team under John Gruden, I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. The Raiders had a lot of money to spend and that's exactly what they did. They spent it. So I wrote like a bunch of stuff down. Gone is to hear Whitehead who struggled in coverage last season and, and are two of the most talented linebackers on the market in Corey Littleton and Nick, Nick Kwiatkowski. I think Littleton definitely proved his worth as a three down linebacker with the Rams while Kwiatkowski, he shined in a rotational role with the bears. So I like both of those signings and the Raiders didn't even stop there. They brought in Malik Collins on a one-year deal uh, to play his age 25 season in Las Vegas. I'm pretty sure it's 25. Uh, I think his age and experience as a starter for Dallas last year, make him a candidate for a breakout season. In my opinion, Uh, they added more of a veteran presence in the secondary with Eli Apple, Jeff Heath too and that duo will replace Daryl Worley and Carl Joseph so that's going to give the defense close to a total overhaul um offensively don't forget the they're getting Abram back this year don't yeah yeah so a- Abram with the with those safeties that should be cool um and I think they may look at a safety in the draft probably later um offensively the Raiders didn't really make a huge splash but a few of their signings could be important I think Marcus Mariota could do to Derek Carr, what Ryan Tannehill did to Mariota in 2019. That is to say, that is to say the Raiders might have found their next starting quarterback on a fairly cheap deal. And meanwhile, Jason Witten will be a safety blanket for whoever starts under center. He has been for 16 years. Even in his post-retirement second run, he's been a consistent Keep in mind his in the veteran year. leadership, veteran leadership for Darren Waller. That's gonna be huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely sure. huge. I'm excited to see that. Yeah, he's been a consistent target in the passing game. He's now going to bring all of that to Vegas. Yeah, yeah, I think the other thing that they brought in Witten, Witten in for was the fact that they need another red zone target because that's not what Darren Waller was. He was a great yeah. down-the-field guy, but he wasn't yeah, yeah, red zone. Yeah, I, I agree. Mean, Witten will be able to teach him how to – like the red zone moves and how to succeed in the red zone. So I think that will be really yeah. good for Waller's development. I like a lot of the signings the Raiders had. I think they had a need at linebacker and went out and signed the two best linebackers in free agency – unlike a couple of the other teams that had a need at linebacker. So that was good. But And then the Aguilar signing and Mariota signing, they have upside because, I mean, all first-round picks have upside. Yeah. Mariota was, has the potential to be very good, and Aguilar has shown that he can be a serviceable wide receiver. He gets open. You, I mean, that's why so many passes are on him. The problem <laughs> is he just hasn't been catching just them as catch. of recent. So if they can teach him how to catch the ball, I mean, he's still a good receiver. He's shown that a couple years ago in Philly. So – I don't have a problem with that signing well, like some Raiders fans might. So overall, I think I'd give the Raiders an A- minus because I think that they had two of my favorite signings for what they needed in Kwiatkowski and Littleton. But other than that, I think it was a bunch of risky signings. Yeah, I agree. I think the Raiders showed good self-awareness to identify their needs, and they took big steps toward filling them. You know, in a division with Hunter Henry, Travis Kelsey, Noah Fant. Coverage linebackers are so important. And signing both Littleton and Kwiatkowski shows that the Raiders know that and they're building their defense accordingly. Um, Taking a shot at Mariota is a perfect compromise of addressing the position without completely giving up on Carr. So I I think that move will... I'm not going to grade that move specifically because I it it all depends how it plays out. Um, But for now, I'm going to give the Raiders... I'm going to go with Jack. I'm going to give him an A minus, probably an A. Um, with the Raiders, I think they, they're, they're addressing like pieces that can help develop their young core again, like Josh Jacobs, Darren Waller. I mean, they're, they're focusing on, and oh, sorry, Max Crosby, one of the underrated, most underrated D linemen I think we have in the NFL. So I think um, this team is, this team is heading in the right direction. Obviously they still have John Gruden, which they've heavily invested in. So hopefully he can bring these players up. Uh, and especially in a stack division, I think they were looking good last year too, right? Six and four before, obviously they kind of slipped out, but I mean, they only got better here. And I think when I look at their team, I think they can really cause some problems. I feel like they're a type of team that can win some big games, all, always contend in any game. Like they can play anyone. I think they've got heart. Um, I think they got to control Abram a bit because I see him kind of his personality is something I think they should look out for because he he was arguing with Gruden a lot on hard knocks. But um, I think in terms of overall grade, I think I'd give him a solid B plus. 
Yeah, I'd agree. I think they still have some great pieces, though, right? We know how good the offensive line was last year. Richie oh, yeah. Cognito was so great last year. I cannot and believe they brought him back. That's another thing we didn't mention. Right, and mm-hmm. that was great. Incognito, we thought he was going to be an issue in the locker room. Yeah. Nothing so far, and I think that's, that's a huge win for them. Josh Jacobs, we know, is a developing star. Darren Waller, great tight end, right? The wide receiver course still has a lot of question marks for me. I don't know what they're going to do. It depends what they I like Tyrell have. Williams, though. I like him. I like him, but yeah. I don't see him as a number one. After yeah. seeing him last year, I do not see him as a number one. They still need a number one. The question That's where they go is still a question mark, in my opinion. They'll get that. Their car was They'll good. They'll get that but... in the 12th pick. Right. I, mean, I, I hope they so. Can get... Judy or Lamb will be there. Like, it's kind of almost yeah. guaranteed. All now. right, you might disagree this. with me on this, but I thought a really good draft fit for them was Henry Ruggs. Because think about it. In their division, the Chiefs are in their division, right? Who's their number one receiver? Tyree Kill? I feel like no, Ruggs could literally be a Tyree Kill. No, I agree with that. I, but I feel like that's a ceiling. And that's something you're reaching for. I don't – but I don't see Ruggs as like – because, see, I don't think Tyreek Hill is honestly the number – it's like Kelsey is the number one yeah. target. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I don't see Ruggs okay. being a number one target versus, like, Darren Waller. I don't see him – because I don't think Darren Waller is, like, that guy that, like, your ultimate security blanket. Not yet, at least. So I think they do need a receiver like Judy or Lamb that can be the number one guy and have Darren Waller as an amazing compliment, which is what he was last year. So I think they should address uh, – obviously, they should address receiver. I think that's a pretty clear cut here. Uh, Judy or Lamb would be great. I think I would prefer Judy in that system just because of what he's done for Alabama um, mm-hmm. as a number one receiver. And uh, I think – but, yeah, like, based back back to my grade, I mean, the B-plus was showing how they've improved, and they are definitely going to get even better through the draft and just overall. Yeah. So let's move on to the Chargers. I think this is my favorite offseason of any team – this entire year so far it's one of my favorites for sure i think you know after moving on from philip rivers who's been them for what seems like forever the chargers are about to embark on a new quarterback era and they didn't resort to the free agent market to replace rivers they missed out on tom brady however they did upgrade the offensive line by trading the aging russell okun for trey turner who's a pro bowl guard and they then replaced okun with brian bulaga which gives them an undeniable upgrade up front Um, And franchise tagging Hunter Henry allows them to either give the tight end a year to prove he can stay healthy and live up to his vast potential, or they could just trade him away. And they also stuck to their guns uh, and let Melvin Gordon walk after a disappointing season in 2019, holdout shortened. And then they signed fellow running back Austin Eckler to a four-year extension. So that's going to set up an Eckler-Justin Jackson backfield next season, which I'm really excited for. Um, Chris Harris highlights the defensive acquisitions. You know, he was one of the best defensive backs available and he's going to play slot corner at a high level. He can also chip in on the outside if necessary. Um, I think the one signing that I really just was kind of iffy on was Limbaugh Joseph. He's a good, not great signing. I don't think he, what he is, what he once was he, and he's 31, but I think he can still provide some value for, a run defense that was pretty middle of the road last season. So I think out of all their moves, I'd say probably Chris Harris was one of, uh, I'd say Chris Harris was the best. And I'd say Limbaugh Joseph was the worst. I mean, when we look at the chargers, I absolutely loved what they did. I mean, getting Trey Turner, I'm all about offensive line. And what they did with Turner and Bulaga was amazing. I think they, they got much needed depth up there and they got younger as well. Uh, franchise tagging Henry was extremely important because I think he's one of the top five tight ends we have in this game and uh, when healthy obviously and he's he's been so productive when on the field and what they did with Chris Harris there think about their secondary okay we're thinking of Casey Hayward Chris Harris Desmond King Derwin James Adrian Phillips I mean this this secondary is le- absolutely lethal and this year um, Adderley too the uh, rookie from last yeah. year Yep, and then obviously the signing, I think we didn't mention, but Nick, uh, Nick Virgil or Nick Vigil, I forget how to pronounce it, but I think he was a good signing. Uh, yep. And I think the move of Philip Rivers, I don't know if you touched on it, but I, I actually like getting rid of him in this scenario because, I'm, I mean, I've never been a Philip Rivers fan. I just don't think – I don't even think he's a Hall of Famer, but I think what he's done – like for the team, the Chargers have always had this, this notion of being really good and somehow not, you know, winning these big games. And it's always been under Philip Rivers. He just hasn't – he just hasn't – seem to win these big games in like the big moments like he always comes up short and just just now with the Chargers right I believe they had I think 11 out of their 12 losses were less than seven points Uh, and that's that's absolutely crazy to me so I think a quarterback change was needed and honestly I think Tyrod Taylor is 
pretty serviceable this year. And if they want to go with Herbert or even Tua uh, in the draft, I think they can easily redshirt him. Or they can even go after, you know, a cheaper option. Like Cam Newton won't be that cheap, but I think with the cap space they still have, I think Cam Newton would be a very interesting fit there. Even in Andy Dalton or even in Jameis Winston, I think they can go after a quarterback there and redshirt their young guy. But I'm okay with Tyrod Taylor. I really like their moves. And I think they, they're going to be a problem in the AFC West. I think that you can, I can easily see them going back to the form they were two years ago. Yeah, I, I think, in my opinion, what happened was the rich got richer. Their defense was already great. They made out. They got some even better guys in terms of yeah. the linebacking core. Vigil was a great signing. Depth they needed up there in terms of the running game at the linebacker position. Chris Harris Jr., great signing. Uh, the offensive line needed major help. They brought in Bulaga. It's just there's still a huge question mark for me at quarterback. I don't know what they're going to do there yet. I think they we need to see what they do at the draft and what they do, whether they want, they want to sign Cam Newton or if they're just going to go with Tyrod Taylor. I still need to see what they're going to do with that. Can you guys yeah. see Eckler being a number one? I can. Yeah. I, yeah, that I can. was one of my favorite parts about their offseason is making him the number one and getting out of Melvin Gordon's situation because it just really wasn't working out between him and the Chargers. I think that them getting out of that situation just in general is an upgrade because of how much drama he really brought to the team. I think Chris Harris Jr. was my favorite signing of the entire free agency period um, just because – I think that he can be very versatile for them. He can play outside corner, I think, more than people think he can. And also, I think he'd be a pretty good safety alongside. Uh, well, he doesn't even need to play outside James. corner. I think I, – I don't think he, he can. He, he can. It would but help. The, but he's going to – I mean, I think, I think you keep Casey Hayward and Desmond King on the outside and just have him play in the so, slot. You no, know, King's in the slot. Been. King's in the slot. I feel like King is a better outside corner than Harris, though. And I've seen you, him play on the That's outside. the beauty of that. You can rotate the two. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. you're right. I think Harris is very flexible position-wise. I think he can play safety or slot corner, which would be very good for them. Um, you touched on it. The offensive line, they upgraded at two positions in pretty big upgrades, which is something that is hard for teams to do, especially in an offensive line class this year that was pretty weak, in my opinion. So getting Bulaga, who I think is better than Conklin and I think should have been paid a little bit more than Conklin, and then getting Trey Turner – I think those are two pretty great moves. So they're the closest team I have to an A+. Plus. I just don't know if I can give an A-plus to any team because there's no way to have a perfect offseason unless they had gotten Tom Brady or something. So I'll give them an A, but it's the strongest A that I'm going to give out. I, think. I don't yeah, think it was a um, perfect offseason, but, I mean, in terms of, like, yeah, I'd probably hover around A-A. minus A. I think the Chargers needed to do what they could to prepare for their quarterback transition. You know, whether it's Tyrod Taylor – or a rookie under center next season, protection and weapons will be paramount for the Chargers to have success. And they address both of those things this offseason. Um, Harris and Linval will both contribute to a defense that's, you know, looking to take the next step. And I don't think they lost much. So I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I'll give them a very strong A-. minus. Um, when we look at the Chargers, I, I don't know why you didn't like the Linval Joseph. I think it was a bit expensive, but I – I'm, I'm just worried about his a, age, and he's – when looking at previous years, I don't think he is what he once was. But, but I thought it was adding, some great value. I think, I think the Chargers defensive line is better than what the Vikings had, and he was there to kind of anchor it. So he's get, going into a system with Melvin, Ingram, and Joey Bosa. I like the signing. It was a bit expensive, but, yeah, they had to overpay. So I was fine with it. I agree with Jack. This is probably the best grade I'm going to get. I'm really close to an A+, because I really like what they did with uh, – the quarterback situation. I think they should have gotten rid of Phillip Rivers and they shouldn't have, you know, gone out and spent big money on anyone yet because now they can easily get Cam Newton for a lot cheaper than before. Whereas like where they would have had to trade a fourth round pick and some cash or something like that. So this is really close. Like I'm really strict grader. I don't like giving a plus. So I'm going to give them like a really, really solid a, but like it really depends if they, you know, draft the quarterback that they need and they're able to, you know, keep, keep their system going. I, I could see this becoming an a plus, but right now I'm going to give them a really, really solid a. I'm going to go with A-. minus. Kept on bringing in pieces. We'll see what they do at the quarterback position. I think that is still key for them. It's arguably the most important position in all football, right? They still yep. need a really good oh, one yeah. to prove themselves. As This AFC West has proven to be very competitive, especially with mm -hmm. the great off-seasons all these teams really had. Yeah, yeah I mean, Christian, I think you ta ta talked about it. I think you touched on it really well. Sorry, I just wanted to say, like, for the quarterbacks, I think the AFC West has – like this, this is one of the divisions with like a big question mark on them besides obviously Patrick Mahomes. I think, you know, Drew Locke, we have to still see how he will develop. Obviously I think I'm a big fan of him. I think he will. I mean, Derek Carr, what will he do with this new kind of team? 
uh, or even Mariota. It really depends who's going to take be under center for them. And the Chargers, right? I think they have big questions too. So all all of these teams are talented all around. I feel like it's just I, I can easily see two or even three teams coming out of this division in the playoffs. Yeah, I think, and especially having all of these teams have very good offseason. When your worst offseason is the reigning Super Bowl champs who had no yeah. cap space to use anyway, that's pretty damn good. And so I, I was really impressed with the AFC West did. I think that the Raiders and the Chargers both had two of my favorite offseasons. So I can easily see both those teams getting into the playoffs next year after not making it this year. Mm-hmm. I agree. All right. Well, I mean, obviously the AFC West is very good. Thanks, Christian, for joining us. Thank uh, you. We're going to move on to the NFC West next. All right, now we're moving on to the NFC West. We have Tommy joining us. He's a Niners fan. Tommy, tell him a little bit about yourself. Uh, I go to Bellarmine. I uh, play football. Uh, I'm a quarterback. And uh, I've been a longtime Niners fan. I know the whole NFC West division. I've been following him for a long time. And, uh, yeah, see it today. Yeah. So we're super excited to have him on. Let's start with the Cardinals. What do you guys think about them? I mean, the Cardinals undoubtedly emerged as one of the big winners of this offseason. Cliffs Kingsbury, he's going to love the addition of DeAndre Hopkins via that trade that sent David Johnson to the Texans. But I think the team's investments in the defense will help it take, take it to the next step. They got Devondre Campbell, and he led the Falcons in tackles last season. Uh, Devon Kennard, he's been an underrated edge defender, in my opinion. He racked up seven sacks in each of the last two seasons with Detroit. Jordan Phillips is an interior defender who can generate pressure inside, but I feel like his nine, he had like nine and a half sacks last season. I think that's a little bit misleading, but I'm excited to see what he can do this year with Arizona. Uh, Ultimately the Cardinals have done a good job of putting pieces around Kyler Murray. They needed a number one receiver and it's, it's hard to do better than Hopkins. So. Yeah, I think the Cardinals, what they did with uh, Kennard, I think obviously the Hopkins trade was pretty, pretty big. And I think it's kind of we're kind of some, seeing a similar pattern of what the Cardinals are doing to what the Browns did, except I think the Cardinals got a better kind of better personalities than what the Browns did last year. Hopkins is not a guy that's going to, you know, demand a huge role in the team. He kind of knows what everyone kind of knows what they do uh, up there in Arizona. And I think Fitz, Fitzgerald is going to be a great mentor for him, especially because both of them are known for having some of the best hands in the league. Um, obviously Christian Kirk is there. I really like him. I think he's a great complimenting piece, uh, to what they're trying to do. And, uh, I think it really just comes down to what Kyler Murray's going to do because this is his sophomore year. Obviously he won rookie of the year controversially. I don't think he should have, but I mean, now we're going to see what he can do with all these weapons his sophomore year. And I think obviously they're going to, uh, address the offensive line in the draft. I think we can all agree there. So he's going to have some pieces around him. And I love Kenyon Drake. I think he's a great fit there. I think he's, I think he's their true cut number one back. So getting rid of an expiring contract like David Johnson, who is, sorry, not expiring, but like a bad contract with a lot of money, uh, dead cap with David Johnson. I think, I don't know how, I don't know how they finessed the Texans into that deal. Um, But to keep their first round pick and to keep all these pieces. And again, the signing of Kennard, I think that's great for their defense opposite Chandler Jones. I think this is a great tandem and I think they've got a bright future. The only thing I see wrong with them is just their division. And Kyler Murray is the only thing I see that's a question mark. We really don't know if he can be a star in this league. Um, and I think he's got to prove some people this year. And we'll see what, how it goes. Yeah, uh, I got to agree. I mean, I love Hopkins. I do. I love Hopkins on this new offense. I mean, he, he can do a lot. He can, you know, take away uh, many of the looks at, um, from the safeties, you know, um, and he can really get uh, these cornerbacks to look at other um, wide receivers, you know, and him. So, like, they can clamp to both, and which will open up many new things for um, the offense for Kyler Murray. They can run the ball now. You know, the, if you spread it out, you can really get a good run for Drake in there. Uh, they signed uh, their left tackle, uh, Humphreys, back. So, they yep. got a solid, solid mm-hmm. guy there on the left side for uh, Kyler. And it's all up to him at this point and his connection with uh, Kingsbury to see what they will do. What do you think yeah, about Christian Kirk? Like- I think Wait, Christian yeah. Kirk, I think Christian Kirk, he's a little small, but he's got the speed and he was able to do a little bit, you know, with what little, you know, stuff he had around him. Like Cardinals, Cardinals really had no offensive weapons last year. Not much, except for like Kyler and like maybe Andy Isabella. Not really. He's, he's just got speed, but he's kind of small. And Larry's kind of slowing down. So there wasn't much, yep. but he was able to do a good amount. So I think he's, he's pretty good. He could be like that. Um, 
he could be like a Jarvis Landry to Odell type thing where, you know, Odell's a big target. So, you know, corners yep. and safeties are going to look at him and then it'll open up for Jarvis to get many catches. Or in this case, it'll be Kirk. I see him more of like a Will Fuller kind of thing back in Houston. I think he's, yeah. he's really similar to what, how Will Fuller plays. Yeah. And also he's, I mean, both of them have health problems, but he's been on the field more. And he's shown that, like, against, like, softer corners, like, I don't know if you guys remember this, but against Tampa this year, Tampa has the worst secondary in the league last year, but he tore him up for, like, 140 and three touchdowns. So I think you can see those similar type of games. You know, obviously they're not going to be consistent, but, like, I can see – I can easily see bursts against, like, bad corners and bad teams, especially with teams that don't have depth of the cornerback position. So I can really see him having a good, uh, a good year this year. What I like about Hopkins is most people think that an air raid can succeed as long as you just have a lot of fast receivers. It doesn't always work like that. And sometimes yep. you just need that one star receiver that'll open it up for the other three or four receivers that are on the field. So I think Kingsbury's offensive play calling ability is going to be so much more this year with Hopkins because it'll open it up for Kirk, Isabella, like Hakeem Butler, who didn't get to see very much last year. So I loved Hopkins. I thought Devondre Campbell and Devon Kennard were two pretty good signings on their defense. Because now their linebacker core of their 3-4 is perfect. And they have Chandler Jones and Devon Kennard off the edge. And then they have uh, Jordan Hicks and Devondre Campbell inside. I think that's one of the best cornerback rooms in the league, at least right now. And it fits their scheme perfectly. So I, I really like the Cardinals did this offseason. I'll, I'll probably give them an A-, I, I'm, but leaning towards A. Yeah, I'll give them an A-. minus. They added solid defensive pieces who, in my opinion, I think they're going to be a net positive. Like, even if they don't play up to the money, they're going to be paid. And they also retained important offensive pieces, such as you guys said, Kenyon Drake, DJ Humphreys. They are in position to take a top offensive tackle in the draft at number eight. And I think they adequately use their resources to fill most of their needs. So I'm going to agree with Jack. I'm going to give him an A minus. Yeah, in terms of the grading, I have to agree with both of you two. I, had, I wrote down A minus as well. Um, I think I'm going to stick there, no A, a or no B plus. I think A minus is a good, a good grade for them. What I think I'm interested in seeing is now what there's going to be some pressure on them. And I already talked about Kyler Murray, but we also got to mention Cliff Kingsbury. I mean, this last year was kind of like a testing year. Like, you know, he could do whatever he wanted. It was like, there wasn't really any excuses and they did win some big games. They did go up in Seattle and they beat them. They did beat Cleveland. Obviously that team was kind of iffy, but they still had talent. So I think the Cardinals are some, a team that can contend in any big game. And in, especially in this division, there's going to be a lot of attention on them. So I want to see what Cling, uh, Cliff Kingsbury can do. So I'll give him an A minus. Yeah, uh, I originally had a B plus to an A minus as, uh, as well, and I'll give him an A minus. Um, I know that most people are just going to look at this and see the Hopkins trade and say, "Hey, that's huge." Plus, they got rid of David, who wasn't really anything at the point because he wasn't even starting. Drake had his spot, um, but they did sign a left tackle, and that's a very important, you know, uh, spot, oh, yeah. you know, for Kyler because he he needs protection. And um, I just see this team getting better. That's the overall thing. They're getting better and they're losing things they don't need. And they're adding, you know, Devondre Campbell on D. I just see this team going up. And if Kyler can improve and show what he's got, maybe they develop more of a run game. Uh, I think this team could be a lot better next year and actually compete in this really tough division. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I see a lot of parallels to last year's Cleveland Browns. You have the quarterback coming off of a rookie of the year performance. You have a, a team that, trades for a big wide receiver they have all these expectations but they're in a really tough division yeah. so we'll see if they can come out of this better than the Browns did last year I, I think they will I think, I they, think they, will. they will I do too because I, I think Murray's will. better than Mayfield um but and I, I mean, like I Kingsbury a bit more the next step I they like Kingsbury better more than Freddie Kitchens mm -hmm. yeah. they have a better O-line as well and they're going to address that so I again like I always say it my three things are quarterback coach and O-line Quarterback, I'm not sure yet about the two. Like like I said, I have questions. But coach, obviously, Kingsbury is way better than Freddie Kitchens. And their O-line, yeah. the Cardinals O-line this year, will be definitely better than the Browns last year. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then we go from a good offseason, in my opinion, to <laughs> maybe the worst in the Rams. Who wants to start? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, the Rams are starting to feel the financial stress of Jared Goff's huge contract. They entered free agency with just over 14 mil in cap space. And they had a good, a good number of players set to hit the market, and the result was losing Littleton, Fowler on defense, among others. I think the Rams did try to get back some of what they lost through cheaper deals. They brought in Leonard Floyd, who has a first-round pedigree, even if the results in Chicago were uninspiring. Ashawn Robinson, I, I think he's an analog on the inside. He was a second-round pick for Detroit, who is chronically underachieved. Uh, Andrew Whitworth was – the one incumbent free agent the team was able to bring back, he's 
four years older than Sean McVay, but I mean, he's still playing at a high <laughs> level. Um, releasing Todd Gurley did create some headlines, but I think it made sense for the Rams. His usage had dwindled a bit and cap space is precious to LA right now. I mean, the Rams, what, like they, I was so, this, I was so mad when they traded for Rams, giving up two first round picks for Jalen Ramsey. That is a terrible, I think that is one of the first times in a trade where the the team that got the best player in the trade did not pan out. I think that is one of the only, because when you trade, when in, in the NFL especially, when trades occur, the team that gets the best player usually wins that deal. And I think this, the one where they gave up two first round picks, I mean, I think they took a massive L there. I think this is like, I mean, you're giving up essentially your future and you were banking on the, uh, on the second half of the year and you didn't even make the playoffs. And not only that, Todd Gurley is, I wouldn't say a shell of himself yet, but he's got so many questions coming off the, the knee problems and the arthritis. And Jared Goff has not been – he does not do well without a good running back, and we've seen that. We've seen that in his rookie year. We even saw that last year without Todd Gurley. So I don't like the direction Jared Goff is heading in, and I do not like the direction the team is going in. I mean, they, I like Leonard Floyd. I think, I think Floyd would fit well in that system, especially working alongside Aaron Donald. I mean, anyone would flourish with yep. that – that presence there um they have a lot of star power but like again Jalen Ramsey is probably going to leave because they won't be able to afford him and they just have so many questions across the board they have they have talented players but they don't have a talented team if you guys get what I mean like there's a mm-hmm. huge difference there and mm-hmm. I think especially in this type of division they don't they don't have like I mean McVay can only do so much and we've seen We've seen his weaknesses last year. We saw what happened when he wasn't able to utilize Todd Gurley or even, you know, two running back sets when he had with C.J. Anderson on their Super Bowl run. So there's a lot of questions there. They don't have draft capital. They don't have um, money to spend. I, I mean, I don't like the direction this team is headed. I really could see them spiraling downwards in the next couple of years. Yeah, uh, I 100% agree. I mean, this team, they have no cap space left. I mean, it's all falling. Like, they got Jalen Ramsey, and he's really expensive. Um, they've had, of course, Gurley, and they lost 20, you know, 0.15 mil to dead cap. Like, that's that's crazy. Just releasing yeah. him like that. You, you lose um, one of the best players who was on your team, and now he's just fallen down. Um, and I just see this as um, McVay trying to take over the locker room. I mean, with, with all those uh, great players in there getting paid so much, um, it can get to their heads, and you really can't, you know, create this talented team. You know how you're saying – um, there's talented players, it's just not a talented team. It's that they're not yep. banding together. It's just all for money at this point. And I, the person who, the only way I see them coming out of this is if these players, you know, start performing. And I think that um, comes back to Jared Goff. You know, he's really young, got paid a ton. And will he be able to pull this team out or do something? I don't know. And McVay, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and McVay, McVay, he had a good, you know, first year with that zone run, but I guess teams just caught on and Gurley's now gone. Yep. He was a great runner. He was great in that system. Um, and it's just unfortunate for the Rams right now because I do not see them um, getting better at all. And with Whitworth, I mean, you are signing, you know, back your guy, but I mean, that's only something very little. And you, without any, you know, first round draft picks ahead, um, your future is not looking too good. So Yeah, I, I didn't have a problem with them cutting Gurley because I thought it kind of needed to be done. But if you cut Gurley to save money and then you go out, you sign – you sign Leonard Floyd to a ten million dollar, uh, ten million dollar contract for one year. You sign Whitworth, your forty plus year old tackle, for three more years. You sign Ashawn Robinson. Like, if you're, it, oh, and we forgot to mention they resigned Michael Brockers. If you're cutting mm-hmm. Gurley to save money, why are you going out and immediately spending that money? Like, they should be focusing on maintaining the cap space they had just gotten from Gurley. The reason they cut him was to save money, not to go out and spend it all again. Well, keep in like mind, that. they did need to fill some holes that they had. But, yeah, no, they didn't have any cap space to begin with. Like, yeah. it's kind of like what mm-hmm. Minnesota was kind of in the hole with, too. Like, we'll talk about it later. But, like, they didn't have – they were literally under the cap. Like, they were in negative. And um, the trade – like, when they traded Diggs, they're still, they're still suffering from the problem. So, the Rams got this whole load of talent. I, I think it was in the 2018 offseason when they started just bringing in a bunch of guys and that allowed them to have that Super Bowl run. It's not – it's – I think they're hitting like a bell curve here. I think they're, they were spiraling upward. And I think the loss of, um, or sorry, the trade for Jalen Ramsey, I think just started this whole downward trend and they haven't really found a way to go back up because wh- where do you go? Like first round picks are very, very important in the N- NFL. Yeah. It is so important. 
Mm. And no matter what pick you have, you could have the 32nd pick and you can still have a star there. I mean, we've seen it countless times. And in the NFL, like with the Rams, especially like it's hard to overcome losing, losing the cap because in the NFL, it's a hard cap. They don't have any leniency there. And with the Rams, I mean, do you, I don't trust Jared Goff. I think I've lost a lot of faith in him over this year. Uh, he had a lot, I, I believe he had, um, I think it was around 40. He would have had 40 picks if not for drop passes. So dropped interceptions. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's bad. That's really yeah. bad. So, and that's a problem. And he's not getting a better running back than Todd Gurley. I, I can guarantee you that through the draft. You're not getting a better option than him. Even with his arthritis, he was still decently productive. So I, I don't like what they were going. If I, I'm going to start out giving my grade. I'm going to, this is pretty generous. I'm going to give him a C. I think that's pretty mm. generous because just because I, they I were able agree. to, I know what you mean. Yeah. I, just because I, they were able to keep their main core, like they still have Ramsey and he, he is a difference maker. We can all agree there. Like he is a, he is an Island. I mean, he's no Darrell Revis or anything, but like he, he is, he's got his own Island there. So I'm going to give him a C just because they still have talented players. And uh, I love Cooper cup, Brandon cooks, Robert Woods. So they have their core still intact for now. But, I mean, their outlook towards the future I don't like. So, that I'm going to stick with a C. Um, uh, I'll, go with a, I'll go with a D plus. I mean, the Rams are in a bad cap situation because they had to pay stars. And most of those guys are homegrown talents like Goff, Aaron Donald, Gurley, who will still affect the cap with dead money. And, basically, they'll just have to go through the draft to restock the shelves, per se, with talent. Still, the Rams clearly got worse in free agency. If Robinson and Floyd live up to the money they received, it's probably going to be because of the attention Donald and company attract in Los Angeles. Those two are, I think they're more likely to be beneficiaries of good situations than assets in and of themselves. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give them a D plus. I'm, I'm really struggling with this team right now though. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm going to give them a C minus because I mean, I would give them a really low grade, but they're just in a bad situation. They have no money and Gurley yeah. spiraling down. You can't really can't control injuries like that. That's just the game of football. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stick, I'm going to say it a C minus right now. Yeah. So like, I, I see what you mean that they were in a bad, a bad spot. And I thought they were going to fix that by cutting Gurley, like I was saying earlier, but then you just go out and make all of these moves that are just putting you in a worse cap situation. And I, I didn't like a single one of the moves they made. And so like, I don't want to give an F, but like when you have an off season in which I don't like a single one of your moves and a lot of them, I thought were bad, bad. Like it's really close to an F or a D minus for me because it was easily the worst wow. off season of any of the teams. And the the thing that like they didn't bring back Nikel Roby Coleman, Dante Fowler, or Corey Littleton, all of whom I think are more valuable to them at the moment than Andrew Whitworth, who oh, had a bad year point, last yeah. year. Mm -hmm. Who had a bad year last year and they signed him to a three year contract and he's already like forty five or something. He's insanely old for yeah. a three year contract. I just don't understand a single thing the Rams did this off season. Yeah, their O-line didn't do well. Yeah, actually, I'm going to I'm gonna shift my grade. I'm actually going to go from a C to a D plus, maybe D, because I just completely mm -hmm. just forgot uh, the Dante Fowler loss. I think that was huge. I think, I mean, the Falcons got, I believe the Falcons picked him up and yep. uh, also picked up Todd Gurley from them. The, like, yeah, their defense was decent last year, and now they lose. I forgot about all the core they lost. I think I'm just, I'm just, I still have some hope because of, of their coach, Sean McVay, I still have faith in him. And uh, this team can't – like, they've shown they can still win games, but it's really hard. I feel like they're a better home team than road team, and uh, they've ha they have they have a decent schedule this year. So I'm going to I'm gonna change my grade from a C to a D plus. But, again, like, there's, there's still some hope for this team. Like, I can still see them winning some games, maybe even a winning season, but it really depends on the development of Jared Goff without Todd Gurley. All right, let's yeah. move on to your guys' favorite team, the Niner. What do you think is going to go on with them? Okay. What do you think about that? I can, I, can, I can start off with this. Um, so Buckner, you know, being traded, that's a big deal. I mean, you lose a big presence on the D-line there. Um, and I, as a fan, you say, well, I mean, I don't like this. But at the same time, I kind of see what they're doing. Because, one, he's expensive. So they're getting rid of him, you know, with a trade. For, but for also, like, a number one pick. It's a number one pick at 13. So you see what they're going to do here. Um, they could possibly at 13, they could take a wide receiver, one of their biggest needs, losing Emmanuel Sanders. Um, but he's old. So I'm, I mean, I think it's okay to let him go, but again, he is a great route runner. Um, but you know, their biggest needs right now are corner and a wide receiver. Um, and at D tackle, they're pretty solid. They signed Armstead. So I think they're pretty set there. They also got, um, 
I'm pretty sure uh, DJ Jones is back there still. So would you say would you say Armstead benefited though from having a good deal line around him? Um, and he still does. I mean, like yeah, he still would, does. But but like with Buckner there, like I think that really really helped him to get the amount of sacks. That he did. Definitely. Well, you had to pay is, one of them. But what I see is I see improvement from him. Like I've seen a lot of improvement from him because he's been a very slow um, increase, but he's done a lot by himself just watching his gameplay. He's been able to shed blocks. And um, I think being the head honcho there at this point in his career is really going to you know, make him be a leader on that D-line and maybe improve it, I think, even maybe even make DJ Jones better. Um, but the, I want to go back to the Buckner trade. Um, so, you know, you lose a big piece, but you got, you know, pick 13. So what are you going to do? I mean, available at 13, you may have um, possibly Ruggs or uh, Jerry Judy or CeeDee Lamb. So the question is, do they take a wide receiver there and improve that, maybe get a true number one, or um, trade away pick 13, have someone climb up for uh, a really good wide receiver because of the stack receiver class. You never know. So, I mean, I just see the, all these possibilities from the Niners, and I just want to see what they can do because if they don't benefit from this pick, I mean, I'm going to be uh, very disappointed as a fan, but as this team, it could, you know, um, get a lot worse. What do you guys think? They could even trade away 31. I mean, I I personally take a receiver at 13 and probably look for a trade with 31. And if you can't trade away 31, then probably take interior interior O-line because that's next on the list. Um, But, yeah, I feel like the Niners spent the offseason doing what good teams end up having to do, deciding which one of their uber-successful draft picks was worth extending and which one could walk. They decided yeah. to keep Eric Armstead while flipping to Forrest Buckner for a first round pick. And you know what? Yeah. While it's never fun when a player as talented as Buckner leaves, the Niners are well stocked with defensive line talent. And I think the pick can, you, as you said, can be used to replace him or help them replace Emmanuel Sanders. And they also decided to hold on to Jimmy Ward. We never touched on that yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He did have yeah, all those injury really- issues, but I feel like he can be one of the best safeties in the league. He's really versatile. And re-signing injury-prone players is always risky, but, I mean, it's hard to find a player with Ward's specific skill set. So I really like the moves they made. The Niners are a really interesting case. I think – so, first of all, I I think they did make the wrong decision with Buckner and Armstead. I I think they did have a choice. They had a 50-50, whether you stick with Buckner and you look for a trade partner in Armstead. And I honestly think you could have gotten a very similar value. Maybe a lower pick, like, but it was still probably would have been a first. There were a lot of suitors for Eric Armstead. And the thing is, Buckner was younger, and I think he needed less of, of other talent around him to be in his own kind of class. Because you never know with football. Like, there can be injuries on the D-line, and they're going to have some, the next man up, someone step up. And I think Buckner was their guy. And, in fact, like, you saw it even in the Super Bowl. Like, he was literally three inches away from ending the game by sacking the home. And that was all him on that play. Uh, like okay, but in my game. opinion, I think it would have been easier to replace Buckner than replace Armstead. Exactly. If yeah, we look yeah. at the grade. Well, Buckner is younger. So, I mean, it's, it really depends it, on how younger, you He's younger, but you got you to gotta look at it from a depth perspective. What's I mean, going to benefit though, Buck, this team Buckner would have, going Buckner would have been slightly more expensive, but not a lot. Maybe three mil more a year. And the Niners weren't in that much of a cap trouble because they knew Sanders was basically going to walk. But I do like the pick. Like, I think the pick was a decent – you got a decent haul for him. I think that was a decent haul, uh, especially for what you can get in the draft. I honestly think Debo can be a number one, so I think Ruggs would be a good fit there. Uh, CD could be a decent number two. It really depends on how they want to go with this. I think the loss of Mike Person was pretty big because he did get a lot of snaps mm-hmm. in the offensive line. And especially when they lost their tackles. They lost McGlinchey and they lost Staley. And they were still able to run the football yeah. like crazy. So – and just to see how much offensive line depth they had – was really insane to me. And obviously they, uh, they were able to get uh, Tom Compton, um, Ben Garland, I believe they also re-signed. Yeah. So um, the Niners, I think it's a really interesting, I, I, like, I think the Buckner thing, it's, it, it really can go either way. But um, mm-hmm. the Niners are a team that I think, I think it goes back to the question of what is Jimmy Garoppolo? Like, I, I don't, I don't trust him in big games. He's been a winner, but like, in the big games, not really. Like, I don't I don't know, like... But, I mean, you can also can... blame the Super Bowl partly on Shanahan. But, yeah, he, did, even, he did disappoint. Not even the Super Bowl. Like, we've seen big games throughout the year. Like, because not everyone gets to play in the Super Bowl. So, we got to look at primetime games. I would definitely look at that. And, obviously, against Seattle, for example, in that overtime loss, he had Debo that, wide that's open. That's one game. There, that, I mentioned the, the Seattle game. Um, 
the one against Arizona, he kind of got saved. And then even against New Orleans, that was George he Kittle. He won in the play. NFC Championship. He won in the divisional round. Yeah, yeah, he won he, against he won, the Packers. He won, but that was a team effort. Like, this is a re- weird example. You don't need Jimmy saying. Garoppolo to go out and be Aaron Rodgers. Like, I feel like – No, I never said that. My point is – he, he can't – he has to be more than a game manager. And you saw that when he played a really good team in Kansas City. He had to be more than that, and he didn't perform when it mattered. My problem is you need a quarterback that can do it when it matters most. There are quarterbacks like that. There are definitely quarterbacks. Like, we've seen it throughout. We've seen Eli Manning do it. We've even seen Joe Flacco do it. Like, there are quarterbacks that can step it up when it matters most. Jimmy Garoppolo is not at all a bad quarterback. He's won a lot of games. I think he's – I don't remember his exact record. I think he's like 19-5 and five as a starter. Like, that's a really good record. So. When you look at what he, he's doing with the kind of money he's getting, he's getting top 10 money. Like, this team can build the pieces around him. They definitely have an amazing roster. I think they have a top five, easily a top five roster in the NFL. But it's, like, more than that. They have Kyle Shanahan. They have John Lynch, who's a great GM. I think it just depends on Garoppolo's, quote-unquote, development. Because, I mean, obviously, he's not young, but he's also not old. So I, But I don't trust him in big games, and I think the Niners should look into – I mean, I think they should take this year. I think this should be a, a proving year for him. If he doesn't prove it, I think he's oh, on yeah. the fourth year of his contract next year. So I think you can on, – honestly, if he doesn't prove it this year, I think they should get. Uh, they should look to move him. No, yeah, uh, I, agree, I agree with that. I actually don't because when I look at Jimmy, I see someone who's had, like you said, 19-5. and five. That's only uh, 24 starts. He's like a young guy. He sat behind Brady for those m- for many years. Yep. So even though he's around like 27 years old, I think he's still – he's just got to improve. If you look at him in the pocket – He's very shaky. You see his legs move a lot and he doesn't, he's really, you know, kind of timid, I'd say. Um, And that leads to, you know, very aggressive shots and a lot of picks, but a lot of big plays. You've seen him make a lot of big plays, even against the Rams, that 13 that he, they converted, I think two 13 and seventeen in a row or something like that. Those are two big plays that he was able to come through. And I just think with a great team, like the 49ers, everyone overlooks Garoppolo because the whole team is so good. So I just think with a little bit of growth, he could really become something really good. I honestly think so. It's just, so, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, the the class is going into like these later years, like the class of 21 quarterbacks are insanely good and class of 22, I'm sure is going to be just as good. So when you look like, like Jimmy Garoppolo is a case where I think like, again, like this is, this will be his third year on his big deal, I think. And I think third year is a good way to say, like, it's a proving year. Like, when, when I still remember when Kaepernick got that huge deal. The first year he was decent. I, I believe he earned a Pro Bowl selection. But then as the time went on, right, like, he started to decline. He started to be more careless with the football. Less of a um, – he started to use – he started to rely Teams more on Teams figured him out, too. Like, I, I think exactly, that's his yeah. mindset, too. I think that's his mindset. Just like Gurley. Gurley got all this money, was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinks he's, you know, yeah, he thinks he's hot stuff. And then he just ends up saying, well, I'm paid now, so I don't really need to try. And you can't have that mindset. So you got to pay money to players that don't don't have that type of mindset. You got to pay players that are great and, you know, care more about the team mentality, I'd say, like Kittle rather than a Gurley yeah. or a Kaepernick. Most definitely. I think yeah. the Niners, the players, the best part about them is that they know their role. Like they, they have that. I say that all the time, but this team really defines that. Like, Everyone knows what they're supposed to be. And even Jimmy Garoppolo, like he knows he's not going to, you know, throw for 450 yards and five touchdowns to win a game. He knows he's, uh, and even sometimes he might only throw for like 75. But I think the team that they have, it's still intact. I don't, I mean, I can, on, I mean, unfortunately I can see them having some type of Super Bowl hang, maybe like a steady, like a slight drop in wins, maybe like 11 instead of 13 or 10 instead of 13, especially with this division. But overall, I think they kept their core intact. And I think if we quickly go to grades, I'm just going to give them a B minus because of the, my only thing is I didn't like the Buckner over Armstead choice. But I oh, yeah. like they kept Jimmy Ward. So that's my grade. I'll let you guys Okay, know. I'll, I'll give them a B plus. I think this is the kind of offseason that should be the goal for most franchises. You know, the Niners didn't win the offseason with flashy signings, but they did retain key talent and they got a good return on the talent they had to let leave. And winners have to make these kinds of decisions. And I feel like they navigated things as well as it could. So I'm going to give them a B plus. Uh, I'm going to give them a B because we don't know how, what's going to come of this pick in the first round. And now they have two exactly. picks and, and something big could come here. And I don't know yet. So I'm going to stick it a B plus they did what they needed to do. And even though they didn't sign Sanders, he was going to demand a lot of money and he's old, which means he's going to decline. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick it a B. I, I, I liked what the Niners did because they're, going to have some cap issues because they're going to have to pay 
Buckner. They have to Kittle at some point. I think getting out of Buckner's deal was good because uh-huh. now they'll be able to upgrade with another great player on a rookie contract. And if you can go from Buckner and lose Buckner and Sanders to gain CD Lamb and cap space, I think that's a, a great move. Yeah. So I give them a B plus because I, I like what they did. So let's move on to the Seahawks. There's not a whole lot to talk about with them. Not as many moves as the other uh, teams in the division. What do you guys think of the Seahawks offseason? Yeah, I mean, the Seahawks set out to rebuild their offensive line, and I feel like they succeeded in doing so, but whether that will mean improvement is questionable. Um, Cedric Abu, he he couldn't get on the field in Jacksonville, and he was a straight-up disaster in Cincinnati. Um, And then they also got Brandon Shell. He was tied for ninth among tackles and sacks allowed within last season, so I don't think neither is guaranteed to be an upgrade. Uh, Greg Olson and Philip Dorsett, they're, they're decent assets for the offense. Um, the club opted to keep Jaron Reed over Quinton Jefferson. Reed has demonstrated a higher ceiling, if that makes sense, with he had double digit sacks in 2018, but Jefferson outproduced him in 2019. Um, so that's a little bit questionable for me, but if they're confident in Jaron Reed, then so be it. Bruce Urban, I think he figures to help a pass rush that fell way below expectations last season. Of course, the last puzzle piece could be Jadeveon Clowney. He hasn't re-signed with them, but he remains on the market. So it should be intriguing to see what he does. The Seahawks, I think, I think it like really, they didn't make that many moves, but like, I really like the Greg Olson pickup. I, I, I don't know why. I think it's just because Will Disley like was doing really well until he got hurt. And I think Greg Olson's a great kind of mentor well, for him. He's injury prone too. Too. and, and yeah. kind of old. So, I mean, that is true, but I think he's just, I think he's a good mentor for Disley. Just like, just and like, Hollister how, there. I, yeah, yeah. And, oh, yes. And Hollister as well. I think, I mean, Chance Wormack was also a decent pickup. Their, their line has never been that great. Exactly. Um, but like, the, see, the problem is like with this team, I always, I can, I, there's like a few t- uh, like uh, players and like coaches that I can't bet against. And one of them is Russell Wilson. So mm-hmm. as the Seahawks still have him, they still have their main core intact. Um, they have their young guys. Both the Griffin twins are still there. Um, obviously, Bobby Wagner is locked up. And, uh, I mean, I think the, the Greg Olson signing was, like, was an interesting way to kind of show that they want to they want to, they want to develop their young guys. And because, um, like, I think the only problem is, like, their running game is really iffy. Like, I mean, unless Chris – like, Chris Carson is there, but, like, he's your second option. I feel like Chris Carson just can't be in – I don't see him being a, thir- a three-down back. And uh, I don't really like Rashad Penny. I don't, I don't see him uh, fitting into that second, second uh, running back kind of role. So I think running back is something that they would, should look to address maybe in the later rounds of the draft. But other than that, it was a pretty low-key free agency. But um, I think they made some decent moves, especially with the Olsen thing and Chance Warner. And I feel like with Olsen and Dorsett, I think Russell Wilson's definitely going to elevate their stock, if that makes sense. And each of them just brings a good veteran presence to the team. So it's not all entirely bad with those two moves. I just think they're a little – they're decent. They're decent. Uh, when I look at the Seahawks, I mean, everyone says that you know, the O-line, you got to improve the O-line. But when I see uh, the Seahawks, I see Russell Wilson. And if you've noticed throughout his entire career, he's never had like a top five exactly. O-line. Exactly. He can just run around and make plays and do his thing. And when mm-hmm. you keep running the ball in Pete Carroll's system, he doesn't really care what running back you have. If you keep running the ball and you have Russell Wilson able to run around, pound and pound, tire out the D, I think they can still do things. Yeah. So um, that's why – sh- should we get to the grades? Uh, I, sure. I give, uh, sure. That's why I want to say B- minus right now, maybe B, because they can still get things done. But at the same time, Clowney's still on the board. I don't know what's going to happen with him. If he goes somewhere else, then I might want to bring my grade down because he's a key piece on that D-line. Um, but, again, the O-line, I honestly don't think there's much of a deal there because they're still going to run their same thing. They're still going to have DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett as um, great options for Russell Wilson. And as long as Russell Wilson stays in shape and still run around, even though he's um, getting up towards 30, I mean, I still think they can um, you know, be a very good contender in this uh, division. Yeah, I agree. I, I liked what the Seahawks did. I, there were some moves I wasn't a huge fan of, like letting Quentin Jefferson go for Jerron Reed. But I liked what they did on the outside with Philip Dorsett and Dunbar. I think they filled out their wide receiver core now with Lockett, Metcalf, and uh, Dorsett. And I like what you were saying about the offensive line. I was thinking the same thing, that Wilson thrives without a great offensive line. So investing a ton of money into the offensive line isn't a great idea for the Seahawks. So I like what they did. I, I'm going to give them a B because they didn't really get – 
very much better or very much worse for me. So that's kind of like right around the B area. But if they bring back Clowney, I can, I'll probably bump it up to a B plus. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, I agree with you guys. Without the re-signing of Clowney, this offseason has been and will be an underwhelming one for the Seahawks. I think the offensive line remake was essentially a swap of shaky parts for just more questionable ones. Um, if Clowney re-signs, I feel like their bargain shopping might have paid off. Uh, but for now, I'm probably going to give him a C. I'm not going to be too generous with them. I think a C is pretty low, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think with the Seahawks, like, uh, I forgot to mention this. I love the Quinn Dunbar signing. I, I love that signing. I think he's a great corner that was, uh, wasn't treated right in Washington. Um, and I think, you know, they chose Kendall Fuller over him. I really think they're, they're both really good. Um, so I like that across um, Shaquille Griffin. And uh, I think what they did with Clowney was actually really good. Like they held firm and now his asking yeah. prices dropped, dropped over, I think, four mil per season. So, and I think it's only going to even go down. I think they can honestly get him for like 16 mil a year, which is, which is not, not bad. I mean, Clowney didn't, didn't produce that much in terms of sacks. I think he only had three and a half, but his presence on the D line is just still really, really important, especially when he was, absolutely wreaking, wrecking havoc against the the Niners that one game I believe yeah. he had like a forced fumble some sacks um so I think I'm gonna give him a B but like I think if they can re-sign Clowney for 16 mil a year or under I think that's 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 a really good uh move in free agency and I think I'm gonna I would bump it up to B plus it all depends on what they do but I think the Dunbar signing I really like Olsen as a mentor so I think yeah B is a really good place to keep him on yeah overall a pretty decent division I think the NFC West is probably the best division, I'm going to say, in the NFL. And they had some pretty good off-seasons. None super standing out uh, like the AFC West, like we talked about earlier. But it was a really good episode. We'd like to thank the two guests we had for coming on. Had a blast. Uh, let us know down in the comment section what you thought and what you'd grade the NFC West and AFC West teams. We'll see you next time.